Hi, it's uh, Lawrence Krauss again, and welcome to part two of why I became a theoretical physicist. Uh, this has been a lot harder for me to prepare, uh, in spite of the fact that it involves something probably much less deep and profound than Maxwell's equations, perhaps you may decide at the end of this. Uh, it's more complicated. And it also um, is something I haven't really uh, talked about in public before. And so I really had to spend a lot of time thinking about how to frame this. So we'll see if it works. And bear with me because this is one of those discussions where you may wonder why the heck I'm even talking about what I'm talking about while I'm talking about it. And in fact, that's exactly the way I felt when I first learned this in my third year as an undergraduate. Uh, but if you can bear with me till the end, you'll see at least why I found it remarkably powerful in terms of helping me understand the power of mathematics to describe the world around us. Uh, sometimes mathematics, it seems esoteric and abstract. So I want to talk about that, the tennis racket theorem. And this requires me to do a fair amount of intellectual baggage development. Um, and uh, let's see, do I, I think it's probably easier if I do it this way, but uh, but I'll have to get it in focus again. And it's not getting in focus, so I'll do this and then maybe, there we go. So I want to get us all on the same wavelength. And hopefully all of you have heard of Newton's laws, force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, that's familiar to all of you, that when I apply a force, I, I accelerate an object. I cause it to speed up or slow down, depending upon the nature of the force. I'm, I, I'm hoping that this uh, doesn't keep plopping back and forth because of the light behind me. Maybe if I sit a little closer, I'll be able to do this. Okay, that, that may be better. And... Uh, and also of the fact of the existence of something called momentum. When you start something moving, it continues to move. That's called inertia. And we describe the momentum as the mass of something times its velocity. A popcorn can be moving very fast, but it doesn't have a lot of momentum. If it hits you, you can, you know, it doesn't push you back. Uh, whereas a tank can be moving very slowly, but uh, you notice it when it runs into you. So it's the product of mass times, times velocity. And in fact, if you look at these two definitions, you'll see that that one implies that force changes the momentum of an object by causing it to speed up, basically. So the magnitude of the force tells you how fast, how quickly it can change the momentum of an object. A greater force can change the momentum more quickly. A lesser force can change the momentum less quickly. So that's basically the content of, of motion, in, 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 uh, of linear motion as described by by uh, Newton and others. Um, but now I want to talk about rotational motion, which is really the great thing about physics as I've often talked about is we tend to do things by analogy. We tend to repeat the same arguments over and over again in different cases. As I've often said, it's like Hollywood. If it works, copy it and keep copying it until it doesn't work. And having described linear motion, those same ideas can be used to describe rotational motion, but it's just a little more complicated. The bottom line is that an object that's spinning, as you know, likes to keep spinning. And we associate with that spinning something called angular momentum. And, and here's, here's how we think of it. Remember that velocity is the rate of change of motion, the rate of change of some coordinate x with, with time. If I think of rotational motion as being going around in a circle with an angle theta, the th as, it, as an object's going around and around, the angle theta keeps changing with time. It keeps getting bigger and bigger and goes around and around and around until it gets back to zero and then starts over again. And so we can describe the angular velocity as the rate of change of theta, of the angle. So we call that the angular velocity. So a constant angular velocity, of course, depends upon the size of an object, and that's the key point. And because it turns out the distance traveled for the same theta depends upon r. And if you remember your sort of plane geometry, you'll know that that this angle theta spans a distance d, where d for small theta, d is r times theta, namely an object that's twice as big around. If you have the same angle that you're spanning, the distance 
on the on on the circumference that you that you traverse will be twice as big, and a circle three times as big will have a distance spanned by the same angle that's three times bigger, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the rate of change of distance is r times the rate of change of angle. Okay. Now the point is that a known force will will produce a known velocity. Okay, with you know, ultimately if I apply force for a little bit of time, it'll produce a, a specific velocity. But but so so if I apply a known force, it'll 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 produce a, a, a specific velocity. But remember, because a bigger circle has a bigger circumference, that same velocity will traverse a smaller angle in the same time, because for a bigger circle, you have to do, go a lot further to traverse the same angle. And therefore, if you want to have a constant angular velocity, if you want to have something that produces a constant angular velocity, you've got to apply something that's not just a force, but a force times r, something that's bigger than the force by a factor of r. So for an object that's twice as big, um, this, this, this thing that you have to apply to get a, a fixed angular velocity is r times the force you'd have to apply to get a fixed velocity. We call this quantity torque. It's basically the angular version of force. If I apply a given torque, I'll produce a given, at first given time, I'll produce a given angular velocity. And similarly, the angular momentum, because a bigger object, once again, uh, in a, it, the velocity, the linear velocity that an object has will produce a fixed velocity, will produce a smaller change in angle over time for a bigger circumference. If you want to get the same, for a spinning object to maintain its angular velocity, it has an angular momentum, which is r times uh, times a regular momentum. So those are the two things we now know about, about angular velocity and angular and rotational motion. You have, in order to produce a given rotational motion, you have to apply a torque, not a force. And the torque, when things are perpendicular, as I've shown them here, is r times the force you'd have to apply. Similarly, when I start an object rotating up, the angular momentum it has is not, the, is not equal to its linear momentum, it's its linear momentum times r. An object that's bigger and rotating at the same rate has a bigger angular momentum than an object that's smaller rotating at that same rate by a factor r. Now, let's just think, let's just put in numbers and we're going to do a little math. We know that momentum is mv. So r times mv is rmv. But what's v? v, the velocity that you're, that the, the distance you're traveling is r times delta theta over delta t, namely that it's r times the rate of change of angle. The actual physical velocity in going around a circle is r times the rate of change of the angle over time. And that's the reason, by the way, that the rate of change of an angle for a fixed velocity uh, is smaller as you, as you go to larger objects and, um, because delta theta delta t is v over r. Okay, so that just means if I plug these two things, I get r m r squared times the rate of change of angle with respect to time. And I call that, remember, the rate of change of angle with respect to time, angular velocity. And so I want to call this quantity m r squared something. And what it really is is kind of the angular mass. It's the resistance to movement. It's harder to get a bigger object to rotate than a smaller object, just like it's harder to get a more massive object to move than a lighter object. And so the angular momentum is I times omega, just like the linear momentum is M times V. So I acts like M, but it's more like an angular mass or what you might say an angular inertia. Namely, it's the resistance to changing the rotation of an object. The bigger an object is, the harder it is to get it to rotate. And in fact, that has a specific name called the moment of inertia. So all, all solid objects 
have a moment of inertia, depending upon their their size and their and their uh, and um, basically their size and their mass. And for a specific object like a little mass going around a circle, that moment of inertia is m r squared if the if the circle has radius r. So immediately we learn something. If I can get this in mo in 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 uh, there we go, in focus. Just as linear momentum is conserved, angular momentum is conserved. If I apply a torque, I change the speed of rotation of the object and therefore I increase its angular momentum. And if the torque is zero, that means the object continues to go around and, rot and, and rotate at, a, at the same rate. And that means the angular momentum is constant. Okay, well that, that has a number of practical implications and it explains some things that you might or might not know otherwise. All of us have observed professional skaters skating and they're turning and as they turn, they bring their arms in and suddenly they turn faster. As they bring their arms in, they turn faster. In fact, I, I have a rotating chair and if it really worked well, I could probably show it. I don't think it does. I don't think it does because I'm not very heavy compared to the chair. But you've all seen it with a skater. And, that, and, and so basically it says, look, if the skater... If, if there's no external force being applied on the skater, then the angular momentum after you pull your arms in has to be the same as the angular momentum before you pull your arms in. And since angular momentum is the moment of inertia times the angular velocity, the moment of inertia before times the angular velocity before has to equal the moment of the inertia afterwards times the angular velocity afterwards. But if I make the moment of inertia much smaller by pulling my arms in, then to compensate, the object will have to rotate faster. And that's why a, uh, a skater does that. That's why skaters can do those moves by pulling their arms in. It's just a property of the fact that angular momentum is conserved and nothing, no external force is acting on the skater when they pull their arms in. Internally, they're doing things, but no external force is acting on them. The other application I know of, and maybe you don't see this so often, when I was younger, you used to, tightrope walkers, people who walk on tightropes often carry a big stick and the reason they carry a big stick is because uh, that increases tremendously their moment of inertia. And that means when you're tilting, when you're walking on the tightrope, um, you know, gravity affects you and it can cause you to fall off and, and kilter. But if you have a big moment of inertia, then you acquire a lot more torque. You, lot, you require a lot more torque. Namely, the force has to be a lot greater in order to produce the same tilt. So if you carry a stick with this, with weights at the either end and it's very, very long, then it'll be very hard for you to tilt and it'll be very easy for you or easier for you to walk in a straight line. And that's why tightrope walkers carry those kind of sticks. So those are two practical implications of, of this rule, which is not what I want to talk about, but it's just getting you there. Nevertheless, it, it does help explain some interesting things, I think. Okay. Now, the complication, and this is where it gets complicated mathematically and also uh, uh, pictorially, that was motion, circular motion in basically one dimension, or you know, an object going around. The object is moving in two dimensions, but, but the axis about, what it, about which it's orbiting is a single dimension. It's always orbiting a single axis. But objects in three dimensions, can of course rotate among many axes. Let me take a random book that I may happen to have, and you know, as it rotates around, it can it can rotate in many different directions, and that means things get more complicated. And one has to now complicate the notion of rotational motion because now there can be not just um, um, uh, that's this is one-dimensional rotations, but in three dimensions you have three axes, and you can have a moment of inertia around each axis, namely the mass of the body times its average radius as it's rotating this way, the mass of the body times its average radius as it's rotating that way, and the mass of its average body, uh, the mass of, of times its average radius as it's rotating that way. So you can have three different moments of inertia. 
And similarly, you can have three different angular velocities. You can have the angular velocity about what we call the z-axis in the States, the z-axis in Canada, or the x-axis, or the y-axis. So everything becomes more complicated. But the real problem, the reason it's really much more complicated, is because of rotation in three dimensions, if you rotate about one dimension, you can change the moment of inertia in another direction. Take a Take, take this object here that I am now have my finger over, some random object that's sort of a flat, not very well made pancake. If I, if I, it, so that's in this plane. If I rotate it so that it's now flat, so I rotate it about, about the Y axis, it now becomes flat. But now you can see its moment of inertia uh, um, along the uh, 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 along the x-axis is very different because now its moment of inertia on the x-axis is very small. So because its its average radius away from the x-axis is very small, and so the problem is as you rotate an object, the moments of inertia in each direction will change as as the mo as this complicated motion happens, and that's so complicated that we can think of a way to try and simplify it. And the solution is to go to a rotating reference frame, namely a reference frame that's fixed on the object. And if it's fixed on the object, then even if the object is doing weird things, you're on the object and relative to you, the X, Y, and Z distribution of material is always the same. So in a rotating frame, the, the moments of inertia in, about each axis are always constant. Okay, because you're on the you're on the object, and so if I'm on this book, if I'm on this book, and as the book moves around, I'm moving around with the book. Then for me, the 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 amount of matter away from the this axis is always the same. The amount of matter away from the average amount of mass around this axis is always the same, and similarly, I guess about this axis is always the same. So. That solves a problem, right? It, it says, okay, the moments of inertia are now fixed. But as anyone who's gone on a carnival ride or on certain kinds of playground rides, you know that if you're, on, if you're on a rotating frame, you suddenly see new forces that didn't exist before. The, 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 the main example I know of, I used to go on this, on this ride, which was sometimes made me sick that they used to have at carnivals, where you stand on a wall and it starts to go very or stand on the floor and lean up against a wall, and it starts to rotate very fast, and the floor disappears, and you get stuck against the wall. Because you feel a force pushing you outward. Because you're in the rotating frame. We call that force a centrifugal force. It's a fictional force. It's not really there. What's happening, of course, is the wall is constantly pushing you inward as it turns around, and by Newton's law that every force has an equal and opposite reaction force, you, you feel yourself being pushed outward against the wall. So you feel these fictitious forces um, uh, 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 outward, you know, and, and, and there's lots of ways to feel it. If you, well, actually, if you're in a car and your car makes a, a, a turn very fast, you feel yourself being pushed outward in the turn. You feel as if there's a force pushing you against the, if you're a passenger seat and the driver is making a left turn, you, you feel yourself being pushed against the window because... Uh, 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 you're in that rotating frame. So, we now know that in rotating frames, there are these extra forces that suddenly appear that appear because you're in a not a, a, in a frame that isn't at rest. And how does that impact on these definitions that I've now told you? Now we're getting close to close to the close to the. Um, the point here, and you may keep wondering, why on earth are we doing this, and isn't this boring? And that's exactly was my reaction, as I say, when I was first learning this in, in, in a classical mechanics class. To figure out the fictional force that affects torque and moment of it, the, the, not the fictional force, the, the, the extra terms that appear in torque and, and, and moment of inertia when you're in a rotating frame, um, it's really... Um, well, you can derive it math purely mathematically, but it's very difficult to do. But I can give a, I can derive it with an example that most of you who've ridden a bike have experienced. And again, my drawing isn't perfect perfect here, but.
but you're riding a bike and you're you're therefore on the rotating frame in a sense because the bike you're 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 fixed with respect to the to the to the tires and the frame of the bike and the tires are rotating and therefore we think they're rotating about this axis that's perpendicular to the tires and that's the axis where we call the angular momentum so it's the angular momentum is in this axis the faster the tires spin the bigger the angular momentum now let's say you want to turn left in a bicycle what do you do all of us know what you do you lean down towards the left you don't turn the handlebar so much as leaning down towards the left and the bicycle turns why is that well that's due to this frictional additional sort of perceived force that this extra term you have to take into account if you're leaning down you're producing a, a new angular velocity in 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 the direction of this arrow here and that means that that it it effectively is is producing an extra angular momentum along this this arrow here along the frame of the bike and the net effect as we all know is to turn you in this direction of this arrow you're, as you're turning left but if you're turning left that means there's an extra component of angular momentum that's pushed now that, that's in this direction so the net result is when you apply a torque or an extra force that produces a, an angular velocity in this direction it produces effectively a motion that produces an angular momentum perpendicular to the original motion and to the angle to the ring to the original angular velocity and the new angular velocity it produces an angular velocity that's perpendicular to that that is the effect of being in a rotating frame when you're in a rotating frame if something if a torque produces an angular velocity in one direction and you already have an angular velocity in another direction the net effect in a perpendicular direction the net effect is to produce an angular velocity in yet a third direction which is perpendicular to both of them now that's kind of hard to that well one can write that using vectors but the net result can be written as follows and this is something called euler's equations it says i1 times the rate of change of the angular velocity in the f one direction call that the x direction if you want plus this extra new term that takes into account that perpendicular stuff i3 minus i2 times the angular velocity in the other two perpendicular directions omega 1 or omega 2 and omega 3 that's equal to the torque in the x direction similarly in the y direction the rate of change of the speed uh, in, in, in the the i times the rate of change of the speed in the uh, of the angular velocity in the y direction is equal to i1 minus i3 times omega 1 times omega 3 and that's equal to the external torque and i3 times the rate of change of omega in the 3 direction plus i2 minus i1 times omega 1 times omega 2 is equal to torque in the 3 direction these are euler's equations and they are look complicated and they are and they certainly look difficult to derive and they are but you can do it by thinking about the three dimensional motion carefully but who cares this was again my attitude when i first was learning this well the answer is let's think about what happens when you have an object like say this book where where about where the it has three different moments of inertia this is the largest moment of inertia because most of the more of the mass is away from the center about which you're rotating this is the smallest moment of inertia and let's see and this is the middle moment of inertia if you work things out so this is the largest this this is the smallest and this is the medium you can convince yourself of that and for more extreme objects you can you can look at it and see three different moments of inertia what if i1 is smaller than i2 and smaller than i3 what are the implications 
Well, let's start and say you're rotating around the x direction. And, and there's not much rotation in the y or z directions. Or what about if you're rotating in the y direction and there isn't much rotation in the x or z directions? Or similarly, you're rotating in the z direction and there isn't much initial rotation in the x or y directions. What's going to happen? If there's no external torque, so t the torque is zero, then those equations I just gave you become this. The, uh, I times the rate of change, I1 times the rate of change of omega one with time is this quantity, minus I3 minus I2 times W2, omega two times omega three. Similarly, similar things for W2 and, or for omega two and omega three. Omega is just a Greek way of saying W really. Okay, but here's the point. You notice that if I1 is bigger than I, if I3 is bigger than I2, which is bigger than I1, then this quantity here is positive, and this quantity here is negative, is positive, but this quantity here, I1 minus I2, is negative. And notice there's a negative sign in front of both of them, all three of them. And so this says the rate of change of I1 omega 1 is has a negative sign times a positive quantity times w2, w3, and similar here. But here, because this quantity in the brackets is negative, times a negative is a positive. So the rate of change of w2 with time has a positive factor times w1 omega1 times omega3. And one can show, and I'm not going to do the mathematics now, but one can show quite straightforwardly that this implies that if I start out rotating in the two direction, delta omega two will grow with time. And so will omega one and omega three. Namely, what this says is it's unstable. You cannot take an object and rotate it around the middle axis of inertia in any stable way. You know, when I first saw this and I saw, okay, that that's a true result and it's unstable, I couldn't care less. And then I said, okay. And then the professor got a tennis racket out, which is why this is called the tennis racket theorem, and had each of us try it. And, and I can do it with the book here. Remember, this is the smallest moment of inertia. I can always do this in a stable way and it will keep rotating in a stable way. Similarly, I can do this and you can do this with a, with a book like that, and it will continue to rotate that way. But no matter how hard I try, and I've tried very hard, if I do this, it can it will never it'll never come back. It'll always it'll always start turning, and you'll end up actually usually with a half flip by the time you get back. Let's see if we can do this. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that, but there was a half flip or a whole flip. It turned around. And there's nothing you can do, no matter how hard you try, because even the small, unless you get it exactly, even the smallest perturbation from an exactly rotating in this direction, no matter how small, it'll grow over time and cause this to eventually flip over. And that may not sound like a lot to you, but I remember thinking to myself, here is an incredibly complicated an esoteric mathematical formalism, which I can derive, and I don't really know why I'm doing it, and yet the result tells me something so powerful that no matter how hard I try, this result tells me, for reasons I'd never be able to intuit otherwise, and, and you can try to have intuition about why this happens, and Richard Feynman once tried and claimed he couldn't think of any intuition of why it happened. Um, but the mathematics is so powerful that you can develop in general. It's just general mathematics that tells you something very simple, but a law that can't be broken, in other words, about nature. I mean, F equals MA is intuitive, but this law about rotating objects, and you try it with a tennis racket. Try it at home with any objects. And, and I, I, I'll probably insert in this video pictures of tennis rackets being flipped or pictures of other things. In fact, one of the neatest videos, which we'll try and insert, came from space because it, there, you know, here you have gravity and if I'm throwing a thing up, I have to, it comes back down. But in gravity, of course, I, zero gravity, I can 
or at zero effective gravity, I can I can rotate an object and I'll continue to rotate. And this um, Russian astronaut or cosmonaut, I guess, observed and and then since then many people have taken pictures of of a rotating bolt, which has looked like a T. You know, if you have a knob and you're trying to rotate it, it has you can check it'll have three different moments of inertia. And if you turn it, if you try and unscrew the bolt, once it comes loose, the bolt will rotate and then stop and roll and go like this and rotate and stop and rotate and you, it keeps doing exactly what we saw but in a very dramatic way and and we'll try and insert that video here in fact the 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 cosmonaut when he first realized this i think it was 1985 i mean this what tennis racket theorem goes way back 100 some odd years but he's but some people call it the theorem after his name and i forget what his name it's a it starts with a d it's a complicated name but the reason it it, it it became interesting was the 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 uh, at that time the Soviet Union basically classified the report he wrote on this because it was recognized of course that the Earth is ro is, is is a rotating object it's not exactly s s spherical so it it has different moments of inertia and the concern was that maybe it would flip over which would of course you know be devastating. And they thought maybe this discovery would cause the Earth to flip, you know, would, would not cause, but would tell us that the Earth would flip over. It turns out because the Earth has a liquid inside of it, you can try it with any rotating liquid object. Energetics always tell you that no matter how you start such an object, it will eventually always be rotating about the largest moment of inertia because that involves the least energy. So energetics will tell you if you have liquid inside that no matter how you start an object rotating, it'll eventually rotate only about the largest moment of inertia because that involves the least energy. So the Earth is already evolving, ro rotating about with its lo about the axis with the largest moment of inertia. It's going to continue to rotate around there and we don't have to worry about ending civilization. But once again, you can see that this trivially and maybe seemingly boring um, description and, and, and uh, uh, um, uh, evaluation of a mathematical expression uh, a derivation is the word I was thinking about, uh, is not only powerful for everyday objects, but actually is relevant for considering the future of life on Earth. And whether uh, you think that's important or not, you can decide. But, uh, but the reason I'm telling you about it is not just now you can play with tennis rackets and books and maybe try and go through this derivation yourself, but uh, I'm telling you because for me in third year physics, that was the first time I'd done a mathematical derivation of something so esoteric that I had no idea where I was going with a result that I really didn't understand the implications of until it started to be applied to something. And of course, in my life as a theoretical physicist since then, it's happened many times that I've been involved in, in deriving things whose derivations is complex and the results of which I never really understood at the time. Some of the most important papers I've ever written have been things that, that, that revolved the derivation and I realized one implication of it, but I never realized the, the deep importance of it till well after the fact. And for me, that's the profound joy of doing theoretical physics. And that's why I thought I'd burden you with that. Thanks.